What's going on guys? Scar coming at you with another Magic the Gathering video. In today's video, we dive into some budget decks with Call Time. Uh, some of these decks are decks that I've kind of previously had on the channel that I'm kind of adding some Call Time cards to, but keeping that budget style. And also some of the decks are some of the newer cards, kind of combining them with the new abilities like Snow and things like that. So it's a little bit of a mixture of both. Uh, if you want to know what I have each of the deck lists, they'll be down in the description below. So if you want to click on a particular deck list that you are interested in, you can definitely go with that. But with that being said, guys, if you like the video, hit that like button. Definitely helps out the channel a lot. If you're new here, want to know post new videos on the channel, hit that subscribe button. But let's dive into the decks and kind of break down each one. So moving on to the first deck here, we have a budget Orzov Angels deck. And I actually find this like tribal style deck to be very interesting with the new card called Rally in the Ranks. If you don't know what Rally in the Ranks does, you play, uh, you play it for two mana and you get to choose a creature type and creatures of that chosen type all get plus one plus one until end of turn so essentially this makes all our angels uh that much stronger and i think it's actually slightly better than glorious anthem especially in a tribal matchup just because glorious anthem makes all creatures plus one plus one but for one more mana but especially if you're playing very specific tribal i think this card definitely fits in into the style of deck so this is one of the cards that i actually do find very interesting in the deck uh now moving on to the other cards in the deck and this is on a basis of being very budget those are the only four rares in the deck i do have rares in the sideboard that you can definitely add into the deck I would say I, these are a selection of the best angels I personally think, and then depending on which ones you like the most, or if you have some in your collection, I would say go about adding which ones you want. Um, though I would also suggest in the sideboard as well, I do have uh, Fable Passage and the Pathways. Those are probably some must-add lands into the deck to make the overall mana smoother uh, in a way, just because we play a lot of tap lands, and tap lands kind of slow down momentum. So that's something I would also suggest adding uh, four copies of each just to kind of help that out. But with that being said, let's go over the rest of the deck and kind of talk about each of the cards. I went with the Glass Casket here as our kind of like spot removal for creatures. There's a lot of aggro in the deck, and I think uh, Glass Casket's pretty good just because there's a lot of decks not really playing a lot of artifact removal, and I think this will definitely stay out. Combine this with another card in our deck, uh, this is actually going to be very good in the late game in case it does get removed. But I would say Glass Casket's definitely a way to slow your opponent down if they're playing very aggressive against you. Besides rallying the ranks, which I already went over, we're going to go on to Youthful Valkyrie, which is another card that's from uh, Kaldheim. It's a 2-mana 1-3. It doesn't seem very impressive off the bat, but a 2-mana 1-3 is actually pretty good because three, uh, 3 toughness is actually pretty solid. But the idea here is whenever another angel token or another angel enters the battlefield under our control, we get to put a plus 1 plus 1 plus, uh, counter on Valkyrie. So essentially, this will get bigger the, the more angels we play. So in the early game, it doesn't seem impressive, but in the late game, when we're starting to overwhelm our opponent, if, they're not, if they haven't dealt, dealt with it, this angel, this Valkyrie can definitely become very, very strong. Then we have uh, Starnheim Aspirant. It's a 3-mana 2-2. Essentially, all it really does for our deck, it helps make all our angels cost 2 less. So essentially, turns all our very expensive things into much cheaper things, so allowing us to play other things. Uh, the 2-2 two, two toughness is not the greatest, but just the idea to make things cheaper is always beneficial. Then we have Renegade Reaper. It's a 3-mana 2-3. Uh, Flying, uh, when it enters the battlefield, mill 4 cards. Uh, if one was an angel, we get to gain 4 life, uh, which is actually pretty good if we... This is like our one of our other ways to gain some life in the deck and build a little bit into our graveyard because we have a card that takes benefit of us milling things into our graveyard especially angels so we do play uh copies of this just to kind of for that ability and for three mana i don't think it's the worst ability for my removal i'm playing poison the cup as like a spot removal just because we can foretell it for two mana and then later in the game when we need that spot big spot removal we can play this card and when we foretell it we get to scry a card but if you really need an instant removal it's still a three mana removal which is not that bad at instant speed um but like i said Foretell for cheaper is always great in the late game. Then we got Stalwart Valkyrie, which is a 4-mana 3-2. It's a flyer. Um, this is a card that takes benefit of us having angels in our graveyard, because we can exile a creature card from our graveyard rather than pay this mana, uh, the spell's mana cost, and then we pay for 2-mana instead of 4-mana, which is always good as well. It's a 3-2 for then 2-mana, which is, I think, much better than a 4-mana 3-2. Uh, yet again, if we don't get that benefit, we can always play for 4-mana, but I would try to take advantage of us exiling a creature card from our graveyard instead. We have Vengeful Reaper, which is another card that has Foretell. Uh, we can Foretell for two and then play it later in the game for two mana, the Palm Return or something. And as Flying Death Touch and Haste, it's a 2-3, which I think is okay. But I think the idea here is that it's a 2-3 with Haste. Um, has Death Touch, so we can leave it back for blocking and our opponent then would have to attack into it. And three toughness is actually, you know, a lot harder for certain removal spells. So I, we did get a few from Call Time that can deal with this. But overall, I think the removal is more of a direct removal instead of burn removal, unless you're playing red. Uh, but overall, pretty good card. We got Rampage of the Valkyries, which is actually a very interesting card here overall, just because there's not a lot of enchantment removal. But I, I really like this card, other than it producing a 4 4 white angel creature token uh, with flying and vigilance for 5 mana. The idea is whenever one of our angel creatures die, 
our player each each other player has to sacrifice a creature so essentially if any of our angels get removed from the battlefield other than exile our opponent now has to start sacrificing creatures so they have to kind of think about how they want to attack into our angels if they know that if we block with a particular card that it may die and then they may have to sacrifice another creature um if we if you know if two creatures exchange then they have to sacrifice a secondary creature so their board will start getting wiped out if they attack too aggressively um so it kind of definitely makes them having to work around this particular ability which i actually think is a pretty great ability for a more budget style deck then we got Fierja, judge of the valor it's a two four flyer lifelinker uh for five mana one white two black whenever whenever we cast a second spell each turn we have to look at the top three cards of our library put them into our put one of them into our hand the rest into our graveyard another card that helps us fill up our graveyard for something like Salro valkyrie um as, uh, another way to dig a little bit deeper into the deck because like white and black they don't really have a lot of card draw i think village rights is a possibility but i think this is actually pretty decent because now we get to kind of use three cards and you know and then we get to build two and then pick one that we want uh overall not too bad um but you know it's one of those things that you may want to replace first if you don't think it's that effective but i don't mind it for the, the style of deck and the budget that we're playing and then the last card here is called shepherd of the cosmos it's a six mana uh three three flyer um has the ability that when it enters the battlefield we get to return target permanent card convert it mana cost to our last more graveyard to the battlefield so we can always we can always return any of these cards in our you know two drop slot so either youthful knight rallying the rings glass casket all good options here uh if they get milled by you know our mill stuff or our opponent's mill uh, we can also foretell it for four mana which is actually pretty good so we can set it up on turn two and then possibly on turn four we, we can foretell it for four mana and then getting a three three and getting that ability for four mana is actually not that bad especially if we know we want to return something particularly from our graveyard to the battlefield overall pretty good solid creature now we're getting to the mana overall and the mana is not that it's not it's, it's okay but like i said i think it gets it feels a little clunky sometimes just because the bottom half of our, our mana is all coming to play tap play nine planes seven swamps uh we play a great hall of starnheim which i know i'm kind of blocking but the overall ability if you don't know what it is it, it we can sacrifice it for uh two black and um are two white and a black and we can sacrifice and then we get that four four white angel creature token that you kind of see on the left of me um so that is actually pretty good and has vigilance and flying and then we can activate it whenever uh, whenever we can cast a sorcery so during our turn at some point and then we play some uh snowfield sinkholes which is a white black duel you can also play the the white black duel from like ikoria or corset or whatever that gives you one life if you have those instead of this one I just kind of put there just because it's a Kaldheim card. Um, it already comes on play taps, so our opponent can't penalize us for playing a tap snow permanent. And we have Evolve and Wilds. Uh, we can sacrifice it and kind of fix our mana if our mana feels a little bit clunky. And then this is the sideboard uh, that I'm kind of blocking, but the sideboard will be included in the deck list. And like I said, uh, depending on what you're thinking and what style you want to go, I have, I have a little bit of everything angel wise, and you kind of can judge depending on what you may already have or what you already opened up into the deck. Uh, Life Linking Angels is kind of looking like the best the best method just because there's a lot of angels that can gain a lot of life there's certain cards that will help you gain a lot of life um so i would say pick and choose but i would also say you know you know add pathways to the deck and add fable passages if you have them already just because it'll make your mana base overall feel that much better hey so i'm actually doing this after i actually recorded the whole video but i kind of felt that i didn't really touch on the sideboard i kind of selected and kind of go over some of the cards i have here just kind of give you a better idea of why i selected certain cards for the sideboard overall for the orzov uh budget deck here um i just kind of want to go through those cards kind of give you a better idea so first and foremost i have speaker of the heavens in, in the sideboard here just because we really don't have a one drop and it's a good way if we're getting a bunch of life to produce tokens in the later game and i do think we have a pretty good strategy to gain a bunch of life with this deck so speaker of the heavens is probably a good card to add to the deck if you want to get some additional life gain and have additional ways to produce angel tokens if you already have some copies you could be an ad you do right now uh resplendent marshall is something i'm unsure of he's a three mana three three with flying when he enters the battlefield or dies we can may exile another creature card from our graveyard if we do we get to put a plus one plus one counter each creature we control other than resplendent marshall that shares a creature type with that exiled card so essentially we can choose a, we can exile angel and essentially do give all our angels plus one plus one so he's she's okay i don't really know 100 if if it's definitely a card that's gonna be good um but it's something to mess around with right now Rexus valkyrie is another uh, angel here two four flyer for three mana when another angel or cleric enters the battlefield under control we may gain life equal to that creature's toughness as long as we have seven or more life than our certain life total creatures we control get plus two plus two i think this one definitely could see some play in the deck just on the basis of it has a pump ability and if we're gaining a bunch of life this is definitely a good way to make our things just that much stronger um outside of rally in the ranks so this could be another card that you could add to give our creatures even more additional life gain 
Ancient Angel is another card. It's a card from Zendikar. It's a four mana, four three. Uh, I think this would be a one of in the deck because you put the other three in your sideboard. And this is a good way to keep tempo. So you keep on pumping out four, uh, four mana, four threes. If you're starting to draw into lands and things like that, and you feel like your land uh, flooded. Um, but def definitely a good card to have in the deck. At least a one of and then put the rest in the sideboard so you can draw into it and then sideboard them in as you kind of play them onto the battlefield. We have Starnheim Unleashed. It's a four mana, produces a four four white angel creature token with flying and vigilance. But I actually think this card's gonna be very good because of its foretell ability. We can tap X twice. Uh, so essentially, if we tap uh, five mana, we can get two uh, uh, four four white angel creature tokens. And the amount of times we foretell it, we'll get additional angels. So you can either do it for three mana to get one creature token, two mana or five mana for two, seven mana for three, and so on and so forth if you have the mana to pay for it. Furious's Retribution is another very interesting card for our Angel deck because one, it creates a Angel creature token for four mana with Blind and Vigilance. Uh, the following turn, we can give all our Angels get the ability that we can tap them. We can destroy target creature with power less than this creature's power. So if we have a very big, tough uh, Angel, we can tap that Angel and destroy target creature um, just with the ability of just a tap of our Angel. And then the third one is Angels we control gain double strike until end of turn. So definitely a good way to finish off our opponent if we do play this card into our main deck. Uh, definitely something at least two of, if not more, uh, depending on where you feel like you can fit them in. Uh, Angel of Destiny is another very interesting one. This is kind of like a secondary win condition, just on the basis of once you play it, every time we try to attack an opponent for uh, damage, we then actually, us and the opponent, both gain life. Um, this creature itself has double strike. Combine this with Fierce's Retribution. Uh, you can essentially make all your angels gain you that double that life. So essentially the secondary ability of this getting, getting to 15 more life than our starting life total is a possibility, especially if we attacked with Angel of Destiny. Um, it's definitely a cool little alternate win condition. I don't think you play more than two just because it's like a, a stretch goal um, of a thing to win. Uh, you'd rather try to get your opponent to zero than to 35. Um, but you know, it's something you could try out and mess around with, maybe even one of. Uh, Bane Slayer Angel that I think this is definitely a deck that this deck this card can shine because it kind of came out and it was you know it's a good card but I feel like this deck you know combined with all the other angels definitely become a very good uh very good card uh that you'll see a lot of just on the basis of one it's a flyer it has first strike which is also great and on top of it has lifelink and then uh, even so when it, when, we, when it first came out you were like protection from dragons and demons well with call time there's a lot of dragons now added into the format so this definitely has protection from all those dragons that now they get added so i could definitely see this being as like just a not just a card for this angel deck but definitely a good anti-dragon or anti-red style card just because of the uh, first strike lifelink and the dragon uh you know protection valkyrie harbinger is another card that we can add in the deck it could replace our six drop that we currently have um, at the beginning of our each end step, if we gain four or more uh, life this turn, we get a 4-4 white angel creature token with flying and vigilance. Just another card that benefits us from gaining life. Uh, combine this with Bane Slayer Angel that can swing and gain five life immediately. We can definitely get a 4-4 angel token after swinging it with Bane Slayer. Um, definitely very good. 4-5 uh, for six. And then that ability in, in itself also has life link. So we can definitely swing in with itself and gain the four life that we need to actually get to the number we need. And then, like I said, I think in in this is I would say first upgrade the pathways because having these will definitely, you know, make the deck run smoother because one, you can filter the mana that you need on the battlefield Two, these lands come into play untapped. So there's no check of them coming to play tap first. And then, like, like, like I said, Fable Passage is a better option than, you know, than Evolve the Wilds just because after four or more lands on the battlefield, the land comes into play untapped. So definitely a good card here. Also, side note to mention, too, after playing the deck and I kind of forgot this. So this ability here is not just exclusive to non-land permanence. So essentially you can actually use this ability and get something back like an Evolving Wilds or even a Failable Passage after you've cracked it, if that's the only thing in your graveyard. So that's just something also to think of if you want to ramp up a little bit more to get ready for maybe a big uh, Starnheim Unleashed if you're building that style of deck to get that seven mana that you possibly need to flip this and get that many more Angel Tokens. Just as a side note, uh, I just wanted to mention that as well. Moving on to the next deck, this is a deck that's kind of more just kind of like a little bit of what we already had, adding in some call time overall into it just to make it that much better. And this is like a budget warrior style deck. Overall, the deck is pretty straightforward when it's trying to do. We're just playing a bunch of warriors, taking advantage of warrior tribal. Um, this is definitely a deck that takes advantage of something like Rally in the Ranks. Uh, we have four copies in the deck yet again. Uh, you'll come to see if we're playing like a tribal deck that has any white in it. You'll probably want to play this card just because it'll make anything of that particular tribe that much better. But in the, the one slot here, we're playing Rally of the Ranks. We're playing a mixture of equipments and warriors because 
uh, warriors benefit from equipment. We have like something like Relic Axe here. If it's equipped to a warrior, it gets plus two, plus one instead. I'll combine that with something like uh, Fireblade Charger. It also then will gain haste if it's equipped. Um, we do have Emberclave, a one of in the deck. Uh, I believe if we unlock all the starter decks, one of the decks that play, I think, Boros or even Mono Red. I'm not, I'm not sure which one it is, but you do get, I think, a free copy of this. So I have one in the deck. Uh, if you don't have one, I would say just maybe another common or uncommon. But this is definitely a card that you want in the deck because as you upgrade it, this is definitely a card that will finish games uh, for this deck. So that's definitely a card you want to eventually get. Uh, so the first card in the deck is Resolute Strike. It's a one mana instant speed. Target creature gets plus two, plus two into unturned. If it's a warrior, we get to attach an equipment we control to it. So if we have an unequipped uh, equipment, we can technically swing in. If our opponent decides to block or not, we can then tap one mana and then give it, we can pump it up. And then on top of it, equip an equipment to it, with, whether it's either Relic Axe or even Ember Cleave uh, instant speed. So definitely catch them off guard in that sense. So overall, pretty good card, um, just as a pump or even just a, a quick equipment card. Then we got Usher the Fallen, which is a new card from Call Time. It's a one mana 2-1, has a boast ability that whenever it boasts is an ability that we can activate once it attacks. So once you declare as an attacker, at any point after that, you can pay the two mana and then we can create a 1-1 one, one white human creature to warrior coat token. So essentially we're creating a wider board against our opponent. Uh, so overall, a good way to you know produce more warriors onto the board overall. Like I said before, we have Fireblade Charger. It's a one mana 1-1. One, one. Uh, if, it's, if it's equipped, it has haste. Uh, when it dies, you get to deal damage equal to its power to any creature. So definitely a, a very interesting card that your opponent has to block because essentially you can attack in it even at 1-1 if they block with a 2-2. You can then take that one point of damage and then deal to that creature to finish it off or you can throw it right at your opponent's life total depending on where they're at life-wise. Combine that with some equipments. This thing could definitely get very big very quickly and your opponent definitely will have to figure out a way to deal with it. Next card up in the deck is Core Blade Master. It's a two mana 1-1 one, one double strike and then equipped warriors we control have double strike so essentially as long as we have either relic axe or the ember cleave on them they'll just get that much better uh so overall just a way to give uh just any of our warriors double strike whether it's this one or other ones uh as long as they're equipped i already went over rally in the ranks in the previous deck but as i said you can choose a creature type creatures of that chosen type get plus one plus one we're playing all warriors so all these cards will get that much stronger season hollow blade for two mana uh, solid card it makes it definitely very hard for your opponent to use spot removal or board wipes uh as, as long as we are have a card in our hand to discard it will get gain indestructible to end a turn the only way to kill this is to give it minus x minus x x uh but overall pretty good card combine that right in the ranks this thing can get very big and very beefy pretty quickly another interesting card in the deck that kind of came with call time is actually this uh cole the forge master it's a two mana uh one white one red whenever another non-token creature you control dies if it was enchanted or equipped Turn to its owner's hand. Creature tokens you control that are enchanted get plus one plus one, um, or equipped, I should say. Get plus one plus one. So any of the things that come from Usher, uh, we can definitely uh, you know put an equipment on them, and then they get an additional plus one plus one. And this is a good way for any of our non-token creatures if they're equipped. If they get you know we throw them into our opponent like something like Fireblade Charger, uh, we then get it back into our hand, and then you know kind of try to rinse and repeat overall. Definitely a very interesting card. It's legendary. I only have two. I don't really know. I'm not really sure if I'm 100% sold on it, but it seems very interesting in this warrior style meta. Like I said before, we have Relic Axe. When it enters the battlefield, you have to attach it to a creature of control. So two mana, instant equipped. And then if or, you know if it's not equipped to anything, we pay two mana later and then equip it. Uh, and then equip creatures gets plus one, plus one. If it's a warrior, which essentially our whole deck is, it'll have plus two, plus one instead. Demon Bolt is like our our, our spot removal overall. I, I had the, the Frostbite in the deck. But I really didn't feel like playing, uh, you know, Snowlands just because we're playing a white deck and they have a thing that keeps our snow permits tapped. I thought Demon Bolt was okay. It's we can foretell it for two, and then in the later when we need it, we can you know tap it for one red and deal four damage to whatever targets may be in our way. I think overall it's pretty good, and at the same time too we can pay, pay three at instant speed and deal four damage to target creature or Planeswalker. Um, yet again, you can also put in Shocks. You can put in things, something like, uh, you know fire prophecy things like that but I'm, I'm messing around with this i don't know 100 if i'm sold on it but i did go over this in my call time video of you know common and common cards i think are definitely good to craft this is one of them i'm gonna see how it kind of works out but it's something i kind of have in the deck next card up is forging the tyrant tyrite sword a three mana uh, saga uh the first two chapters we get to create a treasure token which allows us to sacrifice these treasure tokens and then produce any mana so it's a little bit of a ramp in the deck and then the third chapter is we can search our library for a uh, halvar god of battle or a card reveal input to our hand into our library so essentially we can get maybe that ember cleave if we're getting close to maybe ember cleaving uh on this turn that we do search for it 
or even a relic axe depending on give or take depending on if we played one or not uh you know you can search for your library now for the equipment and eventually if we do add halvar to the deck you can always search for him as well we got Kargan war leader three mana three three gives all our other warriors plus one plus one making us that much more aggressive so overall pretty good card as well and like i said before we have ember cleave in the deck it's a six mana equipment Every, it costs one less, one colorless less for each attack creature. When there's a battlefield, we can automatically equip it to a creature we control. And that equipped creature gets plus one, plus one, and double strike and trample. Uh, so essentially, this is kind of like our big finisher. Um, overall, great card. I would say add more of these as you get more wild cards if you don't already have copies of these. Um, and then the mana base is pretty straightforward. Oh, I did go snow, snows in this. But you can always play regular ones. I, you get either or. Uh, you don't have to buy snow cover planes or mountains. But we have nine snow covered plains, nine snow covered mountains, uh, four alpine meadows, which you can also play all these as the normal ones. Ikoria or uh, M21, I think, has the ones that come into play uh, tap, but you gain a life. And then you can play regular plains and regular mountains if you don't want to. And then I have Axe Guard Armory, which we can sacrifice, search our library for aura card or equipment card, reveal them, put into our hand, and then shuffle our library. Uh, so this is overall the deck. Like I said before, the sideboard here has other things you can add. You can add like something like Maul of Skyclay, Resplendent Marshal, which is very good because it's a warrior itself, and then gives you can you know exile a warrior and then give everything plus one plus one. You have Akari, which helps us if we have equipped creatures, and we can have a cheaper way of possibly uh, you know unattached a creature we control. We can tap it, give something uh, indestructible. Halvar because it's either we can either play it as a, a sword or Halvar himself. Uh, Starnheim Unleashed because you create angel token, angel warrior tokens. Pactos is another warrior. Nahiri, because she can make tokens on the battlefield that are warriors and also uh, attach an equipment to them for free. Deal damage equal to uh, deal damage to target permanent equal to twice the number of equipments we control. And we can also look at top six of our library. We can look for a warrior or equipment. So definitely a good overall planeswalker for the style of deck. I've shown all the scalds. Another way to kind of dig a little bit deeper, have some cards exiled that we can play at any time until our next turn. Um, then the second and third chapter are a way to get plus one plus one counters to target creature we uh target creature control whenever we put, cast a spell for two turns which is pretty good but note as a possibility here because if we play a lot of like small drops that are um you know not humans and then a lot of our deck on the top end is a lot of humans this is a good way to kind of like overwhelm our opponent it's definitely something to mess around with this could be definitely a good winota deck and i have a Mirius call yet again another you know angel warrior creature token will fly in I think it's all our non-angel tokens indestructible on a turn, so definitely can be very aggressive, um, just because it'll allow us to have creatures that are indestructible. Um, but overall, I mean, you can kind of pick and choose what you want here, and kind of figure out which way you want to go. Like I said, Ember Cleaves is always great to add more, give or take, depending on how you feel like you want to add certain cards. So this next deck up is my snow deck that I kind of came up with. These are some of the best snow cards, I think, that are kind of in the set. Um, and overall, I think the deck works out pretty good, just with what it's trying to do. Um, you can kind of see here if you don't recognize any of these cards. These are all new cards from Kaldheim, so you do have to have a decent amount of common and uncommon cards to kind of craft a lot of these. But overall, what this deck is trying to do, we have things like Blizzard Brawl, which is a fight spell. If we have three or more snow permanents, the creature that's fighting another creature we don't control uh, will get plus one plus one indestructible, which essentially we can then have a free fight spell, uh, which is pretty good. Heartless Active is some of our spot removal. C combine that with Blizzard Brawl, I think that's overall okay. Priest of the Haunted Edge is very good because it becomes a very good early game blocker, especially if our opponent's very aggressive. And then in the late game, as we kind of start building up snow permanents, our snow lands, we can give target creature minus X minus X, where X is the number of snow lands we control, and then we can activate this at any any time we can cast a sorcery. So overall, you know, a good spot removal in the later game, as long as it stays on the battlefield. Uh, we have Sculptor of the Winter. Um, it's a two mana, two, two that we can untap the target snow land. So you can play it the following turn. You can play some you can you know tap a land untap that land and play and, you know play be able to ramp up to like a little bit more expensive a spell so it's overall pretty decent there we get grim draw draw draugr it's a three mana uh three two we can tap two mana one of it being a snow permanent our snow mana and we can give it plus one plus one and give it menace so make it a little bit harder to block poison in the cup is another one of our removals this one this this time i kind of split them between uh heartless act and poison in the cup depending on what you feel like playing uh just because we can set this up in the later game if we don't have anything early and then we can scry as well boreal outrider is a card that's very interesting here because whenever we cast a creature spell if any snow is 
spent to cast uh of that color was uh spent to cast it that creature enters the battlefield with additional plus one plus one counter so after we play this card anything essentially that comes out will essentially come out with an additional plus one plus one counter on it which is overall pretty great because everything becomes out stronger uh we got ice eye troll it's a three mana two three we can you know tap two snow give it plus two plus zero indestructible in a turn and tap it so a good way to save it in case there's a way that may die uh that makes it very tough to you know use it it's very tough for your opponent to attack into because of that ability especially with that two man open mana we have hailstorm of valkyrie four mana two two flying trample it's not the greatest on paper but we can tap two snow and give it plus two plus two until the turn so just give it that much more it's a good way to kind of finish off your opponent if your opponent doesn't really have anything to block because we start tapping two two snow mana and then essentially just pump it pump it pump it um then we got spirit of the alder guard uh this is actually very surprising for really what it does so essentially what this does it's a four mana zero four which doesn't sound impressive uh when it enters the battlefield you can search our library for a snow land card reveal it put it into our hand then shuffle your library and then it gets plus one plus zero for each other snow permanent you control so essentially our whole deck's snow included in the lands um so essentially we'll have plus one plus one for our plus one plus zero for each other snow permanent so essentially if you have you know the four lands to play it that are all snow plus anything out beforehand this thing could become like a six four seven four depending on how effective you were about playing spells and essentially not just it's not going to search for snow covered swamps and play, uh, forest you can also search for this woodland chasm which is a snow uh land and comes to the battlefield tap or this is actually one of the cards i'm messing around with uh, it's called shimmer drift fail uh enters the battlefield tap uh when it comes into the battlefield we can choose a color and then we get to add one mana of that chosen color this is actually another very effective you know mana fixer so it's a snow land which could get downfall if your opponent's playing like a snow tax style deck um but the idea here is we now can filter our mana um the way we want to by you know choosing the particular color we want to choose it could be something you could play over this uh woodland chasm just because you know it does the same thing essentially instead of it producing two mana of either type it produces the one mana you definitely need I also realized, I guess when I built this, I didn't build a sideboard uh, for it, but there's some si there's some cards I will add into the sideboard that you can definitely craft into the deck. There's definitely some good ones. Um, so as for the good ones, uh, we have Baseless Haven, which is a snow land. This is definitely something you can add into the deck overall, because um, one, it can add colorless. Two, you can tap three snow permanents, uh, snow mana, and essentially make it a 4-3 vigilance creature, and then it's still a land. So essentially you can attack in with it then the following main phase like if you have another play you can actually use it then afterwards and actually play another spell uh you have blessing of the frost we can distribute x plus one plus one counters for the number of creatures we control where x is the amount of snow spent to cast a spell and then we get to draw a card for each creature we control a power four greater so there's a lot of cards that if we put plus one plus one counters on them they get to that four cost and then kind of this is a way to refill uh you got jorn which is actually very good here um jorn whenever he attacks untap each snow permanent we control the other side with the mana we have we really can't play the other side but if we had blue mana in the deck we could you may play target snow permanent card from our graveyard this turn if you do and then just battlefield tap so if we want to splash some blue in possibly we can always you know play the reverse side but jordan on the front side for the green is actually not that bad for three mana blood and snow is actually another good one if we want some you know board wipes just in case um you know we can tap you know six mana destroy all creatures or destroy all planeswalkers and then on top of it, return target creature or planeswalker card where mana costs X or less, where the battlefield or X is the amount of snow spent to cast a spell. So essentially our whole deck is snow uh, mana. So we'd be able to return something back with six mana, which could be any of these creatures. If we have Jorn in the deck, you can get Jorn back. Definitely, definitely very interesting. And then we have Draugr of the Necromancer, which is another snow permanent. If a non-creature, uh, if a non-token creature opponent controls would die, exile that card with an ice counter on it. Then we can then we can actually cast spells among the exile your opponent owns with ice counter on them and then we can spend any mana from a snow source as though it was mana of any color so essentially all these cards here are cards that definitely can be good for the style of deck we're playing um each with their own unique ability um i would definitely say this card and probably the jorn are probably the best two lesson is going to be one of those cards that we can add into the deck and overall just give us some draw ability um, but you know, those are one of those things you can experiment with on how many you want. I would say you probably don't want more than like three or two or three Jorns just on the basis of he's legendary. Uh, this Draugr of the Necromancer is a, is not legendary. So I play four copies of them if you, if you have them. And then I would probably play two of these just as like a top end, you know, worst case scenario, you just need to get rid of the things on the board kind of thing. Uh, Faceless Haven, I would say probably like two or three, just because you, there's a lot of mana in the deck that needs particular colors. You don't want to have too much colorless mana and they get you know 
SOL when it comes to, you know, fixing the mana to play particular cards in your, your deck. But overall, I think Snow is a very interesting concept uh, that you can definitely dive into. And for the last deck, this is a deck that kind of like is one of those decks that kind of already had. Um, but overall, this is like a mono white aggro. It's like a white weenie style deck. Nothing in the deck's really super expensive. Uh, we're only playing 22 lands in the deck just because a lot of this stuff is no more than three mana. But overall, the idea of the deck is to just play a lot of small drops and just try to get wide on your opponent. And we play a lot of things that kind of pump up our board and just get wide on our opponent just to do that much more additional damage. So we're playing something like All Seeds Place Bounty, uh, which is a one mana, one, one life linker. You probably already know about him, probably annoyed by him if you're playing a deck of another color. Just an ability that he can kind of protect something we want to keep on the board by uh, sacrificing for one mana. Definitely overall good card. Uh, next card up on the deck is we have Battlefield Raptor. It's a one mana, one, two flying for a strike. Sure, it's no uh, healer hawk, but it's you know it's it's pretty it's pretty good just on the basis it's a one two flying for a striker. So definitely can tack a uh, block a fervent champion no problem. Um, definitely a good card that I feel like I completely overlooked just because it's a common. But uh, if you're playing like a mono white aggro, this could be a card that fits right into your deck. Uh, we got fight is one. It's a you know one of our cards to help you know protect a human and non-human creature for one mana gives them plus one plus one indestructible. So it kind of helps us kind of pump up and also you know prevent things from dying. Selfless Savior is another card in the deck that allows us to, you know, sacrifice it and give something indestructible. We got Usher of the Fallen, um, another card that is, I've already went over in our, our Boris Warrior deck. It's just a card that allows us to pump out tokens onto the board. Uh, after that, we have Fasari Solidarity, uh, which is a card that's from M21. It's just uncommon. That's two mana. Don't, don't, you know, it's just an alternate art appearance. This is just a normal card that you can get. Uh, it gives each of our creatures plus one plus one a plus one plus one counter so essentially just pumping up the whole board at sorcery speed which is definitely very good because it makes all our small drops just that much bigger last cast it for some spot removal things for three converted mana cost three or less if they're in our way because we, the, the clearer the board the more aggressive we can be uh phalanx tactics is actually a fairly interesting card just on the basis of we get to give target creature we control plus two plus one until end of turn and then each other creature we control gets plus one plus one so if we get very aggressive as our points getting lower and lower you can essentially just pump up the whole board and one specific creature if a particular creature is blocking that creature. Season Hollow Blade is great for this style of deck just on the basis of it can, you know, discard a card, become indestructible. Daxos, yet again, it, as we play more white things, gets more white devotion. Uh, the toughness gets that much bigger, makes it that much harder. It makes a great chump blocker, you know, put, put it in front of something that's very large just because the toughness is just going to go higher and higher. Banish and Light has some other spot removal in case there's something much larger than three mana that we just need to get out of our way. And four copies of Glorious Anthem because it will make all our creatures in our deck just that much stronger by giving them all plus one plus one. Essentially hoping to eliminate, uh, slow down our opponent and, you know, just make the, all our things just overwhelming and our opponent can't do anything about it. And then 22 planes, like I said, just because like we don't play anything over three mana. So we really only need three, like four or five mana at most. Uh, but, you know, we can get away with like three mana in total in the whole game. In the sideboard overall, we have Giant Killer, which is a good spot removal spell because we can play it sorcery instant speed. And we can also play it as a one mana, one two that we can tap two mana and actually tap our target creature that's in our way. Ride in the ranks is a possibility. We're not really playing anything of one creature type, but it is a possibility if this is what you have, you know, have glorious anthems, you need to craft those if you're newer. Uh, but sorry, Ket is also another one because we can put a plus one plus one counter uh, up to one target creature and give it indestructible. Um, also, we can minus two and whenever one or more non-token creature attacks this turn to create that many one one soldier tokens that are tapped and attacking so if we think we have a way to kind of you know do a lot of damage we can minus two and just keep x if we're attacking with five creatures we're gonna get five one ones if we have glorious anthem on the battlefield everything's just that much tougher so then we have a whole bunch of two twos so just something to overwhelm our opponent uh mollus skyclave is another one that's interesting in the deck because it will give any of our creatures that we have in our deck uh you know flying for a strike which definitely makes it definitely tough to uh, you know block into. But Castle Ardenvale is if you have some of these already, you can replace some of the planes uh, with Castle Ardenvales. Because in the late game, if we're not really drawing anything, because there's not really much to draw, so we kind of have we're kind of like we go all in, and if something happens, we really have no way to recover. But this is a good way to kind of just keep on pumping out creatures, especially just get that much that much wider uh, on our opponent. Um, but overall, I mean, the deck is pretty straightforward. What we're trying to do, we're just trying to be as aggressive as possible, uh, you know, with a bunch of creatures and play as many as possible as quickly as possible and just deal, uh, you know, a ton of damage. With that being said, guys, I mean, those are some budget decks that I think will definitely do you well in the early, you know, 
part of call time, especially, you know, as you're kind of building up your collection of particular call time cards. If you like the video, hit that like button. Uh, if you want to know all the decks that I did, went, went over in the uh, list today, they'll all be in the description below. If you're new here, want to post new videos on the channel, hit that subscribe button. If you want to help support the channel, I do have a join button. It's no big deal, but if you do it, it's cool. But if not, I'll see you in the next video.